Our speaker this semester is Dr. Brad Littlejohn. He was raised in South Carolina, but spent a good number of years in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, yeah. Uh, there he attended New St. Andrews College. He received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh, uh, focusing on the uh, work of Richard Hooker, someone you should uh, be familiar with if you're not. Um, he's the founder and president of the Davenant Institute, which focuses on the achievements of classical Protestantism and bringing them to bear on contemporary uh, discussions. This year he's visiting professor of political theory here at uh, uh, Patrick Henry College. And I would encourage those of you who haven't had a chance to get to know him to stop him, chat with him. Uh, he's an interesting guy and we have a lot to learn from him. And I look forward to uh, this lecture that we're going to hear now. So please welcome Dr. Littlejohn. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I'm really grateful to Mark and the entire community here at PHC for the opportunity to teach here this year. It's been a huge blessing already. You have you really have something special and unique going on in this academic community, and I'm very grateful to be part of it. And I'm particularly honored to have the, the opportunity to deliver this Faith and Reason lecture um, in my very first semester here. So like any new kid on the block, I decided to use my lecture to pose the question of whether your college's motto is coherent. Don't worry, at the end I'll say it is, too, so, but we've got a long way before we get there. All right, so the title of my lecture is Christ and Liberty, Retrieving the Freedom of a Christian in an Age of License. <clears throat> so your college's motto is for Christ and for liberty. Today I want to pose the question, do these two things really go together? Are these, that is to say, are these two things really one thing? Is it the case that when we gain Christ, we gain liberty in the only sense that really matters? Or might it be that these are two distinct and yet compatible goods to be pursued by different means, by faith and by politics, for instance? Or, on the other hand, might it be that these two goods are not merely separate, but actually in tension with one another? To pose the question another way, can we in fact be good Christians committed to Christ and good Americans committed to liberty at the same time? Or more especially, can we be good Protestants and good conservatives? At first glance, scripture seems to give us a promising answer. The book of Exodus is a story of liberation and freedom. Psalm 146.7 describes the Lord as one who sets the prisoners free. And Jesus claims this mantle for his own ministry in Luke 4, 18. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Galatians 5, 1 confirms this message. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, if scripture is full of the language of liberty and freedom, and note that for purposes of this lecture, I'll be using these two words interchangeably. The American founding is even more so. You are all, of course, familiar with the words of your college's namesake. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And examples of similar utterances from the American founders, albeit slightly less melodramatic generally, could easily be multiplied. Since the founding, freedom has always been a favorite watchword of nearly every faction in American politics. For instance, in the Civil War, both North and South appealed to the ideal of freedom for their own purposes. However, during the Cold War and since, it became particularly associated with political conservatism. For instance, Barry Goldwater's famous statement, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. Many of you may have seen the television show The Newsroom, or at least perhaps the famous opening scene of the first episode where the star, Will McAvoy, a popular TV news anchor, shares the stage at Columbia University with a prominent liberal pundit and a prominent conservative pundit. He's asked by a rather vapid sorority girl, can you say in one sentence or less why America is the greatest country on earth? The liberal answers with a to typical tone of moral smugness, diversity and opportunity. <laughs> 
The conservative, without blinking, responds, freedom and freedom. With the banal two-word answers of the cardboard cutout liberal and cardboard cutout conservative, and even more banal one-word repetition of the conservative, writer Aaron Sorkin perfectly captures, I think, the vacuous political rhetoric of the Obama slash Tea Party years. In the aftermath of a devastating financial crisis that ought to have compelled a fundamental reconception of our prevailing political philosophy and institutions, Americans instead retreated ever more deeply into the comfortable ghettos defined on the one side by the Obama administration's moralistic preaching of self-realization through diversity and identity politics, and on the other by the Tea Party's militant proclamation through organizations such as Freedom Works of don't tread on me, hands out of my pocketbook liberty. This kind of appeal to economic freedom had been a hallmark of American conservatism since at least the 1970s, when political conservatives aligned themselves with Milton Friedman's economic philosophy, articulated in such books as Capitalism and Freedom and Free to Choose. In any case, though, it has long been apparent that freedom, the watchword of freedom, does not belong to conservatives alone. Consider Justice Kennedy's contention in Obergefell that the Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. Here, the language of liberty or freedom is deployed precisely to serve the politically liberal ideals of diversity and opportunity, opportunity to define one's identity. But of course, this was no late twist in Justice Kennedy's thought. He is particularly known for his declaration in Planned Parenthood versus Casey a pro-choice decision almost as important as Roe v. Wade, that, quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. When confronted with a definition like this, one is tempted to reply in the immortal words of Inigo Montoya, I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> but what then does it mean? Part two, biblical liberty and modern license. For moderns, whether conservative or liberal, freedom is understood chiefly as a lack of restraint, non-interference with one's personal choices, limited only by the harm principle, that one cannot choose to act in a way that harms others or undermines their rights. But of course, since this freedom is now understood as one of the greatest of all rights, then anything that limits someone else's freedom is ipso facto an assault on them and a violation of the harm principle. Now this explains how conservatives can continue to differ from liberals on abortion. Both sides accept the general principle of freedom and the constraint of the harm principle. But the left does not recognize the fetus as a person who can genuinely claim to be harmed and who can thus justify a harmful limitation on the rights of women. This also explains why conservatives have had such a hard time upholding meaningful opposition to same-sex marriage. Within the governing shared logic of our civilization, the only way to justify a harmful restraint on the freedom of gays and lesbians is to show that their exercise of that freedom is even more harmful to others, which is impossible to prove within the current terms of the debate, at any rate without decades of research. Now, note that on this understanding of freedom, which we'll call for convenience the libertarian conception, but which our forefathers would have called license, the sheer maximization of choosable options is understood as the maximization of freedom. Why? Well, because any missing option that I might otherwise have chosen constitutes a constraint on my potential field of action, which is seen as determined by a will that is potentially infinite. For our present day left, this understanding of freedom is realized primarily in the lifestyle domain, with the endless begetting of an alphabet soup of sexual orientations and identities, and a willingness to applaud and encourage every one of these so long as it is freely chosen. For our present day right, it is realized primarily in the economic domain, with ever-expanding consumer choice hailed as evidence of our unprecedented freedom, and an insistence on private property as a zone of absolute non-interference. Either way, freedom is here seen as an inherent natural right, the default state of mankind in the absence of government, government which should thereby be kept to a minimum, and as something that can be taken away only by the transgressive actions of others. <laughs> 
Now, although scripture is certainly con concerned with the evils of external bondage, biblical freedom is more often described as something that we are more than capable of losing on our own. It is, slavery is something that is just as likely to be self-imposed as it is to be the result of external oppression. Consider Galatians 5.1, quoted near the outset. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, although this exhortation could apply to the political situation of a people threatened by outward tyranny, Paul has in mind here the yoke of slavery that the Galatians are imposing upon themselves, a slavery to the bondage of the law. Of course, we might just manage to think of this bondage within the mold of the modern concept of liberty, since the law was, after all, a limitation on the scope of personal choices, chief among them, of course, that highest and most sacred right to eat bacon every morning. But this is not Paul's point, as we will see later on. Warning against another kind of false teacher, Peter puts a fine point on the New Testament's doctrine of freedom and slavery. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Note here that it's not simply external interference that can cause slavery, but whatever overcomes a person, and most importantly, the passions of the flesh. Now this is why scripture quite frequently brings law and liberty together, rather than setting them at odds as we tend to do today. No sooner are the Israelites brought out of slavery in Egypt than God gives them a law to follow to prevent them from becoming slaves again. Not that this law or the freedom that it promises is easy. On the contrary, the Israelites often protest that they would rather be slaves in Egypt again. But the law of the Lord promises genuine freedom, not merely a slavish obedience here and now so we can earn a reward in the afterlife. Over the past six months, I've spent a lot of time meditating on Psalm 119, and I'm consistently struck by the way that the psalmist rejoices ecstatically in the freedom of God's law. I will keep your law continually, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Paul's warnings about a certain use of the law notwithstanding. The New Testament's teaching is the same. James speaks of the perfect law of God as the law of liberty. Indeed, this has been a constant theme of the Christian tradition. Consider merely two examples from 16th century England. One from the Book of Common Prayer and one from one of its greatest detractors, Thomas Cartwright. The great College for Peace runs... O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. To serve and obey God in all things, mortifying our desires, is perfect freedom. Thomas Cartwright agrees. The greatest liberty and freedom of Christians is to serve the Lord according to his revealed will, and in all things to hang upon his mouth. And really, what Christian could argue with this claim? Now, I think that many of us today seek to resolve the stark contradiction between these two visions of liberty, the freedom of non-interference and the freedom to obey God, by sequestering them into different spheres. I know many Christian conservatives who will simultaneously uphold the dictum that true freedom is to be found in submission to Christ, and unswerving obedience to God's holy law, and at the same time uphold the dictum that that government is best which governs least. Then they decry any form of well-intentioned law or regulation as an intolerable transgression on their freedoms. Now sometimes they uphold this dichotomy by appealing to a dubious hermeneutic that claims that God's holy law itself decrees that those governments are best which govern least and this, that a tax or a gun registration law is thereby a violation of God's holy law. Or some would argue that the claims of Christianity are only spiritual and not temporal. And so the upside down model of liberty in spiritual things in no way impinges upon an essentially libertarian temporal realm. We see this, for instance, in certain recent versions of Two Kingdoms theology. And these, but these run up against the stubborn fact that the law of liberty, which the Lord calls us to, 
is a law governing our outward conduct, including our bodily conduct. And thus, it always has temporal implications that cross the supposed two kingdoms divide. Many Christians, I think, simply unwittingly redefine their entire sphere of Christian faith as the result of a free choice on their part, something they've voluntarily opted into, as it were, as an exercise of their sacred freedom to choose. And then within this freely chosen commitment to follow Christ, they are then acting out a kind of servitude to, to God's law, but still within the larger context of their freedom to choose. Now, this doesn't have to be openly subjectivist and individualistic. I think it often takes the form of a certain kind of ecclesiocentrism in which the complete absence of constraint that has been accepted in the political realm ends up being compensated for by a legal, accepting a legalistic church government. And the absence of genuine loyalty in the political realm is compensated for by cultivating a sense of belonging to an idealized church as an alternative polis. In any case, however, this kind of retreat to commitment has the effect of forfeiting Christianity's claim to actually describe and norm reality. We end up obeying God's law because we're church people, not because it orders and governs the universe. So, none of these strategies, I submit, really work. On the contrary, I would submit the tension between these two incongruous notions of freedom our commitment to a freedom of non-interference and a freedom to obey God, has produced immense strains within contemporary evangelicalism. On the one hand, late 20th century evangelicals have stubbornly insisted on imposing God's moral standards on modern America, even when this insistence goes against the grain of their commitment to free market ideology. At the same time, and perhaps especially more recently, the libertarian notion of freedom has shown a strong tendency to eat its way into the life of the church. Large swaths of evangelicalism now find it very difficult to resist antinomianism and the gospel of cheap grace, or to hold any kind of consistent line on obeying God's law as long as disobeying it doesn't violate the harm principle. In any case, it's worth noting that what we have been describing as the biblical concept of freedom actually has much in common with the classical pagan concept of freedom that we might find in Plato or Aristotle. In an illuminating essay, David Bentley Hart says that for the ancients, true freedom was understood as something inseparable from one's nature. To be truly free, that is to say, was to be at liberty to realize one's proper essence, and so to flourish as the kind of being one was. True human freedom is emancipation from whatever constrains from, from whatever constrains us from living the life of rational virtue, or from experiencing the full fruition of our nature. And among the things that constrain us are our own untutored passions, our willful surrender to momentary impulses, our own foolish or wicked choices. Hart here brings together the Christian and classical understanding, passing from Plato's description of the form of the good as the sun which so transfixes our gaze that we are unable to look on anything else, to Augustine's notion of our highest freedom as being non posse peccare, unable to sin. This, Hart says, is, quote, a condition that reflects the infinite goodness of God, who, because nothing can hinder him in the perfect realization of his own nature, is incapable of evil, and so is infinitely free. Now, I think that Hart here overstates the similarity between the classical and Christian notions, as I'll note later on. But he is right to flag their similarity over against the modern libertarian concept. So, section three, three concepts of liberty. The attentive student of political theory will no doubt have discerned in what I've said so far an echo of Isaiah Berlin's famous two concepts of liberty. In this 1958 lecture, Berlin sought to distinguish the Western liberal conception of liberty from rival accounts that tended, he thought, toward totalitarianism. The first he called the idea of negative liberty, the latter account positive liberty. The first he designates as the area within which the subject is or should be left to do or be what he is able to do or be, without interference from other persons. Berlin acknowledges, of course, this can't yield a libertarian utopia, since an indefinite extension of my field of action cannot coincide with an indefinite extension of everyone else's field of action. 
Accordingly, he says, the freedom of some must be curtailed at times to secure the freedom of others. But still, he is on the whole a firm champion of this concept of negative liberty. The second, positive liberty, concerns the source or control of interference that can determine someone to do or be this rather than that. The first, in short, concerns primarily the world, the objective field of action open before us. The second concerns the self, the agent, the subjective conditions of action. For the former, why I act is irrelevant. It's entirely up to me whether I act for good reasons or bad reasons or no reasons. For the latter, however, positive liberty, while, why I act, is all important. Berlin explains, I wish my life and decisions to depend on myself, not on external forces of whatever kind. I wish to be the instrument of my own, not of other men's acts of will. I wish to be a subject, not an object, to be moved by reasons, by conscious purposes, which are my own, not by causes which affect me, as it were, from the outside. Thus it is that to act thoughtlessly or in response to enslaving passions is not on this account to be properly free. Indeed, Berlin says that from this standpoint, whatever is the true goal of man must be identical with his freedom. From this latter standpoint, the contraction of the external field of action available to me need deal no fatal blows to my freedom. I can be free within my own soul as long as I am guided by reason and truth. Now, one thing particularly worth noting about Berlin's two concepts is how the first, negative liberty, tends very much toward individualism, whereas the latter is more conducive to thinking favorably about the life and activity of communities. If liberty consists chiefly in being left alone by others, then any cooperation at all will be seen as a kind of necessary evil. Whereas if liberty consists in pursuing the true goal of man, well then, if man is a social or political animal, then liberty is realized above all in what Hannah Arendt calls action, the life, the, deliberate, the deliberative activity of the polis. In any case, given all that we have said thus far, we might be forgiven for thinking that Berlin's negative liberty names just the kind of political and economic liberty that many in the modern West, including many self-styled conservatives, have come to hold dear. Whereas Berlin's positive liberty is more, in, more or less what the prayer book, speaking for much of the Western tradition, has in mind when it says his service is perfect freedom. But I would suggest that this equation would be much too hasty. In order to begin to understand why, let us briefly consider Quentin Skinner's very insightful essay, A Third Concept of Liberty, in which he shows that while Berlin is quite right to distinguish negative and positive conceptions of freedom, Berlin is misleading to suggest that the negative concept has normally been characterized in the modern libertarian way. On the contrary, shows Skinner, up until at least 1800 or so, most of those who spoke about civil or political liberty did so in quite a distinct sense, something we might call freedom as non-domination rather than freedom as non-interference. According to this notion, which is particularly prominent in English parliamentarian writings of the 17th century, and indeed also in the American founders, Quote, freedom is restricted not only by actual interference or by the threat of it, but also by the mere knowledge that we are living in dependence on the goodwill of others. A mere awareness of living under an arbitrary power, a power capable of interfering in our activities without having to consider our interests, serves in itself to limit our liberty. From this standpoint, it really doesn't matter how benign of a dictator you're living under how little he interferes with your actions, or how many flavors of frozen yogurt he lets you choose between, as long as he is still a dictator, as long as your freedom remains dependent on his whims. This incidentally explains why it was that the American colonists were so outraged by the Declaratory Act that accompanied the Stamp Act, the, or the repeal of the Stamp Act. Effectively, Parliament said to the colonists, we will leave you alone for now, but we don't really have to, you know. So. We thus have, in addition to the negative liberty of non-interference and the positive liberty of the true self, a negative liberty of non-domination, for lack of a better term. Skinner goes on to explain that the pre and early moderns were particularly concerned with this concept of liberty because of its connection to virtue. Those living under an arbitrary ruler will instinctively cultivate the habits of self-censorship and flattery, 
ensuring the decay of courage and honesty, and they'll shy away from performing notably great deeds lest they incite the jealousy of the tyrant. In short, summarizes Skinner, servitude inevitably, inevitably breeds servility. In light of Skinner's portrait, it will be much easier to see how early modern Christians could simultaneously demand political liberty and proclaim that true Christian liberty is found in obedience to God. After all, God is not, in Orthodox Christian theology, arbitrary and whimsical, nor is he in the business of interfering in our activities without having to consider our interests, unlike the Homeric gods or certain false caricatures of Calvinism. God's eternal law, that by which he rules his creatures, discloses itself in the natural law, that by which his creatures are led to their own proper flourishing, and the supernatural law, that by which humans are redeemed by grace. Thus it is that to obey a ruler such as this is not servitude, but sonship. It should also be readily apparent that this third concept of liberty, the negative liberty of non-domination, is in much less obvious tension with positive liberty, than is Berlin's concept of negative liberty as non-interference. This third concept does not necessarily oppose constraints on the individual scope for action, as long as these constraints are rooted in law, history, and representative structures. Indeed, this third concept shares many similar concerns with positive liberty, concerns with individual virtue and communal self-determination. So this brings us to section four, halfway point. All right, so after lots of distinguishing, we will now start the slow process of bringing it back together. We are, this fourth section is called A Common Concept of Freedom, Moral Agency. So we're now in a position to identify a common core to all three concepts of freedom, a definition of freedom that can encompass and bring focus to most of the widely varied ideals that often march under that name. This is the idea of moral agency. That is, the idea of being able to, quote, participate in the order of creation by knowledge and action, as Oliver O'Donovan writes. To participate in the order of creation by knowledge and action. Let's pause to consider the elements of this definition, but in reverse. What do we mean by action? An action, as O'Donovan explains, is an intelligible deed. It is something that we can explain if asked why it is done. And as Aristotle can tell you, that means speaking of final causality, of ends or purposes. As such, it con can be contrasted with a mere operation. To scratch my chin may be an operation, but it's usually not an action, unless perhaps I'm a spy and it's some kind of prearranged signal. Actions then require ends. They are purposeful. Now, to act with a purpose requires that I act in knowledge. I must know something about the context within which I act and the ends for which I act. This is why we do not generally attribute moral agency to sleepwalkers. Finally, this purposeful action presupposes an order of creation. Why? Well, because to speak of ends or purposes is to speak of goods, of things that are perceived as worthwhile things to do either as intrinsically good or as means to other intrinsic goods. And to speak of goods is to presuppose a moral and metaphysical order in which some things are good and are thus worth pursuing by action. So on this account, let me summarize again, participating in the order of creation by knowledge and action, then anything that disrupts my ability to exercise moral agency impinges on my freedom. And this can happen in three ways. It can happen by interfering with my external ability to act, and thus the need for a negative liberty of non-interference, or my ability to know the good and follow through on that knowledge, thus the need for positive liberty, or my ability to form judgments and purposes of my own ordered to the good rather than depending on the arbitrary will of another, thus the need for a negative liberty of non-domination. Now, we could flesh out any of these three points, but let's elaborate this concept of moral agency with particular attention to the first, the negative liberty of non-interference, since I suspect that's what most of us are most familiar with as modern Americans. And indeed, this is where O'Donovan goes. He says, in saying that someone is free 
We are saying something about the person himself and not about his circumstances. Freedom is potency rather than possibility. External constraints may vastly limit our possibilities without touching our freedom in this sense. Nothing could be more misleading than the popular philosophy that freedom is constituted by the absence of limits. O'Donovan seems to have Berlin's embrace of negative liberty squarely in his sights here. But that doesn't mean that negative liberty has nothing to contribute. The potency of freedom, O'Donovan goes on, requires possibility as its object. For freedom is exercised in the cancellation of all possibilities in a given situation by a decision to actualize one of them. Thus, if there were no possibilities, there could be no room for freedom. The problem, O'Donovan goes on, is the idea, quote, that we can maximize freedom by multiplying the number of possibilities open to us. For if possibilities are to be meaningful for free choice, they must be well defined by structures of limit. These structures of limit are actually what authority provides. So that O'Donovan will say, in words paradoxical to many modern ears, that authority is the objective correlate of freedom. For authority, he says, is, quote, what we encounter in the world that makes it meaningful for us to act. Thus it is that when we are thrown into a situation without clear authority, we instinctively look for one to submit ourselves to. We can illustrate this point by considering Netflix or the cereal aisle at any modern supermarket. At first glance, both of these epitomize a glorious realization of the modern idea of freedom. Here we find ourselves, more than any previous generation, or indeed more than any previous year, free to choose, as Friedman puts it. The possibilities before us are nearly endless. And therein lies our problem. Probably all of us in this room are familiar with the experience of paralysis that can take hold in, these, in either of these situations, and myriad others like them. A listless, restless, aimless browsing which becomes ever less satisfied the longer it looks, and in the end picks a movie to watch or a high fructose corn syrup concoction to eat almost at random. Randomness, of course, is the opposite of action. What has happened in situations like these is that the possibilities have been multiplied beyond the point where rational choice is viable, especially given the relatively inconsequential nature of the decisions. It's just hard to find any reason to choose between this or that. It, in fact, it's telling to consider the explosion of ratings and reviews in the digital age. Ostensibly, these provide us more information with which to make a rational choice. But most of us, I would hazard, just as often use them as a way of avoiding or outsourcing a decision. Ugh, which ra Asian restaurant to choose? Well, this one's got 4.6 stars on Yelp, and this one only has 4.4 stars, so obviously I'll choose this one. Or else, in the absence of some clear basis for discrimination, we end up choosing on the basis of mere novelty. Chocolate cinnamon toast crunch? Well, gee, I've never tried that one, so sure. Indeed, even when we do make consumer choices that reflect preferences, we often find ourselves feeling strangely dissatisfied and disillusioned afterward. Think about pretty much every time you've ever been to McDonald's. The ancients, the ancients would have no difficulty diagnosing why. Friedman's view of human freedom, in which more choice is always better since it means more wants are met, is predicated on a deficient anthropology, one that flattens out the complex hierarchy of wants and needs, desires or appetites and passions that almost any earlier ethicist would have told you has to be well-ordered for genuine choice, genuine action to be possible. Advertisers, of course, love it this way. Their ideal consumer, as Benjamin Barber notes in Consumed, is a child since children don't know well how to distinguish between different kinds of desire or to resist acting on impulses. But unfortunately, children don't have much disposable income. Accordingly, adults, preferably single ones, must be conditioned to think and act like children. And that, I would submit, is the increasing condition of our modern society. Now, we can illustrate this contrast between ancient and modern con concepts of economic freedom by looking at the case as a case study, shifting understandings of property rights. Nearly everyone in the Western tradition seems to agree that property rights are essential to freedom, 
but this unanimity can be deceiving. For most modern conservatives, what makes private property so great is that it constitutes a realm of absolute non-interference, a realm where I can do what I want with my own, a space in which my freedom to, to choose what to do or what to make is limited only by my imagination and by how much property I have. So naturally, on this conception, the more property, the more freedom. And so the right to private property and the good of private property are understood as a right to unlimited acquisition and the good of unlimited acquisition. But for the ancients, and indeed right through the American founding, the matter was, I would submit, entirely different. What made private property valuable was that it freed the owner from worry, want, and dependence, from being unable to act because bound to serve someone else or to wait on their charity to get by, or from being so preoccupied with material things that one had no leisure, and thus no liberty, to reflect on higher things and to deliberate soberly. Thus it is that we find the common early modern and early American requirements that only property owners of a certain level could vote. Only they, it was thought, could be responsible political agents. Only they had enough liberty to exercise government. On this conception, more property wasn't necessarily better. Beyond a certain point, having more than you reasonably needed actually subjected you to the kinds of worry, want, and dependence that dog the lives of the wealthy and the bondage to covetous passions. Thus, well-distributed property rather than unlimited acquisition was their chief goal. Section 5, Freedom from Fear and Christian Liberty. This illustration puts us on track to consider one other essential common attribute of the three concepts of liberty, and then to turn at last to consider Martin Luther and the Protestant contribution to Christian and political liberty. <clears throat> if the exercise of moral agency is the essence of freedom, then what is the greatest threat to moral agency and the greatest threat to freedom? The answer seems clear to me, fear. This is most obvious when we consider Skinner's third concept, freedom as non-domination. <clears throat> this freedom is impaired above all by uncertainty, worry, and fear. The uncertainty that comes from being at the mercy of someone known to be capricious, of not knowing what will come next, or how to act well, or even safely in light of it. Such fear breeds a habit of servitude. But fear is present too, even within Berlin's first concept of freedom as non-interference. This is less obvious, but it becomes clear when we consider what coercion, the starkest form of interference, really is. Now, physical coercion in its purest form, which is to say genuinely forced action or inaction, is a very rare thing. It does occur in a high security prison, or if a strong man overpowers me and forces me to go somewhere I don't want to go. But usually, most of what we refer to as coercion, even most forms of violence, do not, strictly speaking, force me to do something. Rather, they intimidate me into doing it. They frighten me into thinking that I would rather avoid pain and do what is commanded rather than accept pain and resist. When someone no longer fears pain or anything that the oppressor can threaten them with, coercion ceases to function, as the countless grim but inspiring stories in Fox's Book of Martyrs attest. Finally, freedom from fear is essential to positive liberty as well. For to act out of fear is not really to act at all, if action is defined as purposefully pursuing the goods that are given to me. Fear disorients me from this pursuit by preoccupying me not with the goods that I wish to pursue, but with the goods that I might lose, and leads to an often irrational paralysis that is unable to deliberate, but reverts to a fight or flight instinct. If fear then, and ultimately the fear of death, is the greatest enemy to freedom, then the truest freedom is found in freedom from such fear. This is what scripture teaches. <laughs> Consider Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And 1 John says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. 
God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected in us, that so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And this is why Luther entitled his great summary of Reformation theology, The Freedom of a Christian. For Luther, the freedom of a Christian consisted fundamentally in the doctrine of justification by faith. The realization that we need not fear God as a capricious judge, but as a loving father. That we need not be consumed with the endless struggle to get by, get ahead, or get into the kingdom, but can rest in the knowledge that we have been accepted already through the perfect life and death of Jesus Christ. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Moreover, for Luther, this also meant freedom from entanglement in the net of late medieval ceremonies, rites, regulations, and penitential procedures. Not because such outward forms have no place in the life of a Christian, but rather because they flow out of rather than toward justification. This freedom is also a freedom from restless desire and want, knowing that all things are ours already in Christ. Quote, if it has the word of God, the soul is rich and lacks nothing, since it is the word of life, truth, light, peace, righteousness, salvation, joy, liberty, wisdom, power, grace, glory, and of every incalculable blessing. All we do to receive these blessings is to cling in faith to the word of promise. John Calvin summarized this later as the first part of Christian liberty. Quote, that the consciences of believers in seeking assurance of their justification before God should rise above and advance beyond the law, forgetting all law of righteousness. However, this freedom is not license. It's not an unfettered liberty to do anything, including sin, which is what Luther's Catholic opponents charged. On the contrary, states Luther, with the sort of paradox that we've seen already in the older doctrine of liberty, a Christian man is the most free lord of all and subject to none. A Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. Freed by faith from having such works reign over his conscience, the believer remains bound by love to let the needs of his neighbor reign over his outward conduct. Quote, a man does not live for himself alone in this mortal body to work for it alone, but he lives also for all men on earth. Rather, he lives only for others and not for himself. The freedom of a Christian is thus not so much a freedom for oneself, but a freedom from oneself. A liberation from the preoccupation with one's own salvation and merit, from fear that one is not towing the line and meeting the standards. Instead, the Christian can actually focus on serving his neighbor. Calvin summarized these two points, these, these points under two headings. Quote, the second part of Christian liberty, dependent on the first, is that consciences observe the law, not as if constrained by the necessity of the law, but that freed from the law's yoke, they willingly obey God's will. The third part of Christian freedom lies in this. Regarding outward things that are of themselves indifferent, we are not bound before God by any religious obligation preventing us from sometimes using them and other times not using them indifferently. Calvin's second part assures the believer that the law of God is James's law of liberty, not the Galatians' yoke of bondage. His third part ensures that when it came to things beyond the law of God, no one could impose upon the conscience of the believer and insist on a religious obligation to do them or not to do them. So finally, section six, the promise of Christian liberty. This doctrine promises freedom from fear in all three dimensions that we have looked at. First and foremost, it offers the kind of freedom from fear that epitomizes positive liberty from the bondage of corruption and enslaving passions. It is the freedom to fully realize our natures, what we were called to be. But it should be noted that it actually goes considerably beyond the classical pagan concept. 
of positive liberty, something that the very anti-Protestant David Bentley Hart fails to notice. Whereas the pagan concept of freedom revolves around the idea of self-mastery, the Christian concept centers on self-renunciation. The ideal pagan was one who, through the practice of virtue, triumphed over his passions and lived in obedience to reason, obedience to his better self. Christianity, however, would insist that even this freedom was itself bondage because it was inevitably tainted by sin. Only when we relinquish this striving for self-mastery and instead acknowledge that we are not our own but Christ's can we be truly free. Perfect freedom, then, is to be a bondservant of Christ, as St. Paul put it. Freed from both enslaving passions and the futile efforts at self-righteousness, the Christian is then equipped with a fuller moral agency, enabling her to act purposefully and knowingly out of love of God and neighbor. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts, writes the psalmist. Second, Luther's freedom offers freedom from the negative liberty of non-domination in at least two key respects. On the one hand, with reverence to God, it replaces the late medieval nominalist capricious judge with a loving father who is faithful from age to age the same in making laws fitting for his creatures and who has shown himself as God for us in Christ Jesus. On the other hand, with reference to the Pope and the ecclesiastical hierarchs who had ensnared consciences with their arbitrary, whimsical, and often self-contradictory pronouncements and prescriptions, Luther's gospel proclaimed a clear liberation. Rather, we are bound only to the firm and unchanging word of God. But what about the negative liberty of non-interference, our modern ideal? At first glance, it seems to be right there with non-domination in the Reformers' protests against Catholic ceremonies. In outward things that are of themselves indifferent, which is to say neither morally required or forbidden, no one could tell the believer what to do, right? We are free to choose whether to have bishops or elders, vestments or no vestments, church calendar or no church calendar, right? Wrong. Just because there was no religious obligation in such things, which is to say an obligation before God, Calvin and the Reformers went on to say, this didn't mean that there might not be a civil obligation in such things. It was entirely possible, they thought, and indeed often fitting, that civil authority might require one to act one way or another in things indifferent. In fact, the reformers defended sweeping civil oversight of large swaths of human life, including many things that we would consider the domain of the church or the family. To this extent, the reformers were anything but modern liberals, carving out a sphere for individual freedom to choose much less to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. So was the Protestant concept of Christian liberty wholly incompatible with modern political liberty? Are we left with the same incommensurability with which we started, that to be for Christ is not to be for liberty, in the sense that most of us have become accustomed to use the word? And if so, what becomes of the civil liberties that most of us have come to hold dear? Time permits me only to sketch the outlines of an answer, but I hope it will be enough to point you in the right direction. First, the road from Christian liberty to civil liberty runs, as many scholars have recognized, down the path marked by freedom of conscience. The Reformers did teach, over against the Roman Catholic Church, an absolute liberty of non-interference in the domain of conscience, arguing that genuine coercion of the conscience was actually impossible, and in any case counterproductive, since God values sincerity, not hypocrisy. And while they argue that conscience in this strong sense was not normally at stake in most matters of human law, which varied by time and circumstance and on which people of goodwill could disagree, it remained the case that, a, that conscience might be at stake that one might be commanded to do something that went against one's loyalty to God. The, Christ, the Christian conscience bound to serve God and neighbor must exercise a genuine moral agency in this service, a participation in the order of creation by knowledge and action, as we saw earlier. Thus, the Christian, while naturally deferring to the judgment of his betters, must still cultivate a knowledge of good and evil that can discern whether a particular civil law violates God's law or not. Moreover even, moreover, even when a law does not violate God's law, 
as such, it might in particular circumstance. Thus the Christian who has learned to be a dutiful servant of her neighbor must cultivate the virtue of prudence that is able to judge in a particular circumstance whether a given action, even one commanded by law, will do harm to the community. Or else, the Christian must learn to see for herself the goodness of the law in question. This discernment and prudence, undistracted by fear, is the fullest realization of free moral agency. By the exercise of such critical intelligence, the citizen is rendered free even in the moment of obedience. Oliver O'Donovan captures the essential insight of this idea of Christian liberty. Quote, sovereignty properly belongs not to law, but to truth. For only a perception of the truth can lead us to wholehearted action. The marvel, we may say, is not that the community can demand conformity. The marvel is that conscience can secretly transcend that conformity and pass judgment on it in light of truth. Protestantism, in, that's the end of the quote. Protestantism consciously cultivated societies of free believers who recognized that sovereignty belonged not to law, but to truth, who were equipped by vigorous educational and catechetical initiatives to exercise this critical intelligence, this moral agency, this active citizenship. This emergence of the free individual who receives his vocation from the Lord rather than from any earthly Lord, in turn could not help but have transformative political implications. The success of early modern liberal societies, says O'Donovan, lay, quote, in the moment of self-abdication instilled by their monotheistic faith. Through that religious moment, they directed their members to become critical moral intelligences and to see themselves, and taught them to see themselves as answerable directly to God. In other words, once you've taught people, once you've taught your citizens to critically examine the laws rather than simply passively yielding to them, you will have to govern more modestly. You will have to accept the reality of disagreement and refrain from passing laws which will be singularly unconvincing and thus increasingly unenforceable. To be sure, this evangelical liberty of the Protestant reformers is still not a freedom to err or a freedom to define your own reality. It is still, notes O'Donovan, the freedom freely to obey Christ. However, it did become and should remain the foundation for a broader domain of civil liberties. Quote, evangelical liberty has proved to be the foundation of a more generalized freedom, including a certain, not indefinite, liberty for misguided and erroneous judgment. This is not to say that there is no such thing as evident and unarguable error. It is simply that each person has, has, not is, his own master. And his master is not the ruler who governs him in the order of civil society. There are some judgments that may be evident enough, but which do not fall to the ruler to make. The ruler has to establish a prima facie interest in the implications for civil order before intervening between any man or woman and the God who commands. Has, not is, his own master. Therein lies the key difference, the decisive bridge that has been crossed in late modernity that takes us from the ordered liberty of the American founders, steeped as they were in the stream of Protestantism, to the nihilistic right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. To be sure, we do have a right to pursue and discern our own concepts of the meaning of the universe. But under the recognized sovereignty of truth, the concepts and meanings that we stake out are not self-legitimating or free from interference if our, right to, if our right to inquire leads us too far from the right. Only our Lord has the right to define the meaning of the universe and the mystery of human life. And it is only on the basis of this order of creation and redemption that any real freedom is possible. So then, can we be for Christ and for liberty? Yes, but not the liberty to obey or encourage other to, others to obey our unfettered desires, for that would dishonor Christ and enslave our souls and societies. Nor is it the liberty merely to blindly obey Christ and force others to do so as we understand his commands. For this would deprive us of the opportunity and the calling 
to cultivate our freedom and the freedom of others as moral agents. Rather, what we are for is the liberty that frees us from fear and equips us to seek God's will and love our neighbors and to love them precisely by giving them space to cultivate their own moral agency and seek the good to which we invite them. Thank you. Thank you.